Packers come in many configurations and have many functions, but basically they have three things in common. First, each packer is made of a flexible rubber sealing element that closes off the space between the outside of the tubing and the inside of the casing. Second, they all have mechanical projections that dig into the casing to keep the packers solidly in place. Third, they all have one or more holes for vertical penetrations which permit single, dual, or multiple strings of tubing to pass through the packer. Depending on the requirements of the well, two different types of packers called either permanent or retrievable or temporary packers are available. Permanent packers are run into the wellbore on tubing or a wireline and set with a small explosive charge. When discharged, these explosive charges generate a large pressure that allows the packer to expand and then be firmly and permanently set into the sides of the casing. Once set, the tubing strings then run through the packer. The rubber sealing elements on the outside of the packer seal against the smooth inside bore of the packer. These permanent packers cannot be retrieved but are constructed of materials that can be drilled through easily. Screwed directly into the production tubing string, retrievable or temporary packers are firmly but temporarily set by rotating, picking up, setting down, or pressurizing up the tubing. Designed to be fully retrievable, these retrievable or temporary packers are used. For example, when a secondary cementing job or squeeze job is performed. As I mentioned earlier, a squeeze job is when additional cementing is required after the initial cementing has taken place or when a workover is in progress. During the process of preparing a well for production, the surface casing is mounted on the wellhead. Its function is to seal off the annular spaces between the strings. Each additional casing string and tubing string are then hung from the wellhead as they are run. Once the well is completed, however, access to the wellhead is no longer required, so they are usually placed just below ground level. Finally, a Christmas tree is installed. Containing a valve manifold that controls flow in the tubing that must be strongly constructed to contain full reservoir pressure, a Christmas tree's function is to control that pressure. In this illustration, the main valves that control the well's pressure are labeled. They are dual master valves, the crown valve, the wing valve, the choke, and the safety valve. Let me explain the function of each. Let's start with the dual master valves which are used to shut in the well. The top valve controls the well's pressure. The bottom valve acts as a backup. Usually kept open, the bottom valve can be used in the event that the first valve fails for whatever reason. Next, the crown or lubricator valve is used when a lubricator is attached. It is used when well service tool operations are being conducted such as through tubing perforations. We'll explain more about through tubing perforations in the next section when we discuss perforating in underbalanced conditions. The wing valve is normally used for the routine opening and closing of the well. The choke is an orifice that varies in size to control the well's flow rate. It also confines full well pressure to the tree thus protecting equipment downstream. Finally, the safety valve automatically shuts in the well when unsafe conditions are recorded such as excessively high or low downstream pressures. With the well prepared for production, we can now return to finalize any additional treatment that is needed before actual production begins. Earlier in the lecture, we got as far as perforating in overbalanced conditions. Highlighting the damage to the vicinity around the wellbore that it can cause, we mentioned 
that the engineering team may prefer to perforate in another way. If they elect to perforate in underbalance conditions, the well has to be made ready with tubing, packers, and a Christmas tree to control the pressure required for underbalance perforating. Since we have now explained the components used to prepare a well for production, we can now proceed with explaining how a well is perforated in underbalanced conditions. Perforating in underbalanced conditions is considered best practices. In underbalanced perforating, wireline through tubing perforating with a small diameter gun that can fit through the existing tubing is performed after the well has been prepared for production with the aforementioned packers, tubing, and surface valving called a Christmas tree. With the packers and Christmas tree in place, the fluid level in the casing can then be kept low so that its hydrostatic pressure is less than the formation pressure. In addition, once the zone has been perforated in underbalanced conditions, it can then be immediately placed on production. Not only saving time and money, through tubing perforating can also greatly reduce any formation damage that might be caused when the flow rates are stopped, known as killing a well, to run down whole equipment. In running wireline through tubing perforating, the crown valve in the lubricator on a tree is opened. The perforating gun is then run into the well and fired. The stuffing box sitting at the top of the lubricator holds the pressure buildup in the formation to prevent blowouts. This pressure buildup in the formation causes the formation fluids to rush out into the well bore, flushing out the jet charged debris along with the damaged formation rock. Underbalanced perforating, in other words, immediately cleans up around the area impacted by the perforating, which should then enhance flow rates when production begins. When the gun is pulled back into the lubricator, the lubricator valve on the tree is closed. The pressure is then bled off the lubricator and the gun is removed. The wing valve is opened in the Christmas tree and the oil should begin to flow. Another type, tubing conveyed perforating, also permits underbounds perforating in a fully equipped well. Tubing conveyed perforating guns are run into the hole below a packer on the bottom of the production string. As you can see from the illustration, tubing conveyed perforating guns are much longer with larger charges. Its advantage is that the tubing conveyed perforating allows the perforating gun to be pushed into highly deviated or horizontal holes that would be inaccessible to a wireline conveyed gun. Now that the well is prepared for production with casing, cementing, perforations, tubing, packers, and a Christmas tree, all attached to the wellhead, it may be assumed that the well reservoir fluids will begin to flow freely into the well bore and up into the stock tank. In wells with highly permeable formations, this is probable. Wells that flow easily without further procedures have what is called natural completions. Many wells, however, require what is known as stimulation treatment. Used because it provides the reservoir fluid better access to the well bore, stimulation treatment helps allow the fluid to flow in formations with lower permeability. By pumping acid into the formation or by creating hydraulic fracturing, stimulating treatments can be highly effective. It can cause production rates to double, triple, or even quadruple. This increase in production can turn a non-viably commercial well into a viable one. Surprisingly, in the fluid's journey from the perimeters of the reservoir to the stock tank, it is the last few inches of reservoir rock where the obstacle is encountered. As I said earlier, stimulation treating operations are used in areas with low permeability. High permeability zones with natural completion do not usually need stimulation. Let me show you an illustration that helps explain the function of stimulation. Here you see the geometry of a radial flow. As the flow approaches the wellbore, the flow arrows begin to crowd each other out. The fluid 
represented by these flow arrows becomes constricted as it approaches the wellbore. This constriction reduces the flow resulting in a decrease in the fluid volume that reaches the wellbore. More evident in lower permeability formations than in higher ones, this reduction in the fluid volume can result in lower fluid flow when production begins. In addition to this natural restriction just described, there may also be formation damage which may also prevent the fluid from flowing freely. Caused when the formation rock comes into contact with the drilling mud, formation damage can appear as one of two types. In the first, some formations containing clays absorb mud filtrate and expand. This expansion may hamper or plug the formation's permeability. In the second, solids in the mud can become entrapped in the pores of the formation, also reducing permeability. Working in tandem or in isolation, natural restriction and formation damage can create unwanted bottlenecks in the immediate vicinity of the well bore that can greatly impact the well's production rate. Production rate, if you remember from other lectures, is figured by calculating the number of barrels per day a well can produce. One of the most important factors in calculating this number is estimating how fast the reservoir can be produced, not just estimating how big the reservoir is. Therefore, successful stimulation treatment to eliminate or reduce the impact of these bottlenecks can better ensure the profitability of a well. Let's look at some stimulation treating operations. They are matrix acidizing, hydraulic fracturing, and fracturing acidizing. In all stimulation operations, treating liquids are pumped out of the surface tank, down the well, inside the tubing anchored by a packer, out through the perforations, and into the formation. In hydraulic fracturing and fracture acidizing, along with these treating liquids, several thousand pounds of surface pressure are also introduced into the formation. In any event, the specific type of treating liquids coupled with pressure is determined by the formation rock and its permeability in the pay zone. The primary function of stimulation, as I said before, is to remove formation damage so that the permeability of the near wellbore formation is improved. For example, in matrix acidizing, different kinds of acids, depending on the formation rock type, are used to increase the number of fractures. Hydrofluoric acid is used in sandstone reservoirs, while hydrochloric acid has a better result in limestone reservoirs. Regardless of the acid used, the appropriate acid is slowly pumped down the wellbore and out through the matrix of the reservoir while taking care to ensure that no undue additional pressure is exerted on the reservoir rock which might cause the formation to fracture in unproductive ways.